Welcome to Hotter Revisited, episode 19. Today we are jumping into Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets. Chapter 1. Yeah, covering chapter 1, The Worst Birthday. Or as we like to call it, definitely bottom 12 of Harry's birthdays to date. Or, so it will fit in the episode title, Harry's Birthday Blues. Because honestly, this really is the worst birthday. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, they're all pretty bad. I feel like they've all been pretty rough to this point. I mean, he, he has some good ones. A few good ones, but most of them are are pretty terrible. I think he had one with his parents. So maybe his first birthday was okay. Uh, before we jump into chapter discussion, I just want to talk about the book in general as a little um, opening before we dive into everything. So... Crazy to think this book was published in 1999. Wow. Other things that were going on in 1999 were the fear of Y2K and the thought that the year 2000 would break the internet and stuff. That was a thing. Also, we are probably in, I think I was in, how, what grade would I have been in? Kindergarten or maybe grade one. Kindergarten, probably. Yeah. Look at us now. Back in the good old days of, you know, eating paste. So uh, I didn't actually, I think I, we talked about this before how we got into Harry Potter, but I didn't read the books in order when I first started. But um, I mean, I was a kid. I watched the movie and I was like, I've already, I know, already know what happens. I'm going to skip to the next book. Because I, you know, I started with uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. But I did go back and read these. This was the first Harry Potter movie I saw in theaters. So that's exciting. And um, but yeah, I didn't actually read this until before Half-Blood Prince was released. Since when I, I was waiting for Half-Blood Prince to come out, I went back and read the first two books because I never actually read them. Yeah, I just, I feel like this book, I really like the mystery aspect. Like the last book was also had a bit of a mystery of like what was in the third floor. But this is actually like a, like a, a mystery based on like, like the background of Hogwarts and like yeah it's a classic whodunit with a fun twist of like school history and it's very exciting and it's in its base of what it is it's fundamentally very fun so I'm excited for that and especially learning about the founders because they're very interesting it's cool because it, it's just another like deeper level of expanding on the world we got a tiny bit of like Marauder's understanding last book we got to know Harry's generation. It's nice to go farther back and really add depth to the world. Give it history. and Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more world building in this book. That's like we we kind of figure out Hogwarts and the main characters. But now we're going to add a few more characters. And we're going to learn more about the Weasleys and more of like the outside wizarding society. We also get quite a few new magical creatures, which is very fun. So starting off, uh, Harry's back in for Drive. Shocking. The Dursleys are afraid of him, but also really pissed off at him. Nothing's really changed. Yeah. But uh, they locked all of Harry's uh, school stuff under the cupboard under the stairs. And they padlocked Hedwig so she can't leave her cage. And I'm just thinking, this is animal cruelty. Like, this is an owl. Like, Absolutely. Can't, wouldn't it, like, something happen to an owl if it can't move its wings for... Like, I don't... It would probably get some type of muscle atrophy, I would think. They're so used to spreading your wings. It's like if you're in a cramped space, like, if you can't move your arms out, like, I just feel like they get stuck that way. Yeah, it's, uh, not cool. It's very uncool. Douchebaggery from the Dursleys. Yeah, poor Hedwig. Like, he's a living creature, and he's so nice. Honestly, why couldn't Harry have just, like, I don't know, picked the lock and, like, let her go free and, like, go stay at Ron's until I can figure something out? <laughs> yeah, seriously. I'm sure Ron would love to have an owl that works and does its job properly, you know? An owl that works. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I mean, <laughs> where is the lie, though? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Errol, Errol's been through some stuff. He's seen some things. He's, he's a pre-retirement retirement phase. He still goes, but he isn't going to do anything. Something I noticed that I, I've seen a lot of posts about um, diving into fandom stuff, but there's a lot of fat phobia in the books that I didn't quite notice when I was a kid because I just think fat phobia was just so rampant in like the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and it's usually all the bad characters that are like talking about their weight in a negative way. Like, um... Obviously, we have the Dursleys. It's always referenced to like, how fat Dugley is. Yeah. I mean, the only character that's innately described as attractive and is a bad guy, kind of, is Gildura Lockhart. <laughs> and no one could believe he's a bad guy because he's so pretty. I think when it comes to the Dursleys specifically, like, 
they could have done it in a way because it makes sense to point out because Harry is so skinny. The fact that they have an excess of things that he almost doesn't have enough of makes sense for the plot, kind of, if they brought it up just in that light. Like, look how little they let Harry eat, and then they have all the food they could want to eat and more. Like, that sort of makes sense just in sort of highlighting the inequalities of what they have access to and how they're treated. But I think the way they do it doesn't stick to that. And it sort of just becomes, oh, they're mean and they're overweight, you know? And it's... it's yeah, it just feels like a caricature. Just I think because that, like, going back into that mindset, like, it's just a bit off-putting to me. Just, like, how much they describe, like, how fat Dougley is. I'm like, okay, I get it. He's overweight. Yeah, like, we, we understand. You've described him to him. We, us, we can picture him the way you intended him. Stop bringing that up, you know? Yeah. Like, talk about his... Like, when I think of Dudley, I think of, like, a lot, often the movie Dudley. He has so many, like, facial expressions that make me want to punch him, which is such a good job on the part of the actor. I'm like... I wish we'd done more, like, trying to describe the little smirks he has when Harry's getting in trouble, you know? Like, that, to me, would be more befitting of the character, be better overall, and also would have contributed more. I'd much rather hate Dudley for him being a little git than them try and get me to dislike him because of his weight. I also think even early on, they kind of try, when they're trying to describe Neville as being really uncool, they they mention that he's a bit pudgy or whatever, yeah, I think he is mentioned as being a bit pudgy, but it's like the way to describe Neville, because Neville's a good character, versus the way to describe Dougley is like... But also like uncool. They're like, he's uncool, he's weird, he's awkward, nobody really wants to be friends with him. Also, he's a little overweight. It's like, okay. And that was also taken into the movie, because I'm pretty sure uh, Matthew Lewis had to wear a fat suit in like the earlier movies or something. Yeah. And I mean, like, I have nothing against Neville, the absolute badass, being overweight, but when they take it and they try and use it as like a... Just another thing that makes him uncool. I don't love that. It's just like, yeah, that's just, but that, that's just the culture that we grew up in. If you look at tabloid magazines back from like the 90s and early 2000s, like it was like really terrible. Absolutely, yeah. I think the ongoing, like the internet meme is like you'd pick up a magazine for women or teen girls and the front cover would be like, love your body. And then the first article would be like, how to lose weight. Yeah, <laughs> diet tips. Yeah. <laughs> 32 ways to lose five pounds in two hours. None of these are legal. Like, moving on from fat phobia and the body shaming. I would just like to say from day one, I love Neville. He's flawless and I don't care what he looks like. He's the most perfect creature and I love Neville. That's why Neville's so relatable though. It's just like, not everyone's this tiny little slip of a thing. We can't all be ripped. So you are concerned that Harry knows no spells? Oh my. Once again, there's like concern. They're like, ooh, we, we the Dursleys are nervous around Harry. He's this bomb that could just explode. And I suppose they have no idea. They're like, he probably already knows how to kill us or turn us into a bat. They're probably like super concerned he can do really scary magic, but he still hasn't done a spell. Yeah, not really. <laughs> like he still has not, like hypothetically off page, he probably did a little more and whatnot in class, I hope. But canonically, in the written words of the book and in the scenes in the movie, he has not yet done a spell. You can turn a hedgehog into uh, something, a teapot, or what it did last book. Wasn't it a snuff box? <laughs> yeah, they're scared that he's gonna like blow them up and like Harry can like unlock a door. I mean, maybe they just think he's the Seamus Finnegan of his class. He doesn't know how to do any magic right, but he knows how to accidentally blow everything up. It is very smart of Harry to, like, keep that fear. So, like, I'm sure he was worried when he came back, they just, like, bury him in the garden or something. And he's like, wait, I could hurt you. So you better not hurt me. It's like self-defense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you mentioned earlier, but um, the earlier books do this thing where basically they recap the, the book before. So we've read Fossil Stone and going into this, yeah. most of this chapter is just basically being like, Harry's a wizard and this is what happened in the last book. And he made friends at school, but his family he lives with sucks and he had good adventures and he's famous, but the family he lives with sucks and he has an owl and he wants to send letters to his friends and the family that he lives with sucks. Yeah, because <laughs> I noticed, I'm pretty sure this goes up to at least Goblet of the Fire and I was just wondering, like, I get why it, they're doing it because th these books were intended for kids so obviously kids have shortened attention spans and honestly like me for someone who skipped like the first two books it, it was helpful just to be like oh, oh refresh my memory but i was wondering is it was it quite necessary like i just feel like especially in the earlier books they really hit back like this is all the th things that happened and it's just very obvious i think 
nowadays, at least the way I read them now, it's annoying because often I will binge read them. Like I'll have a weekend up at my cottage and I'll read them all in order. And I'm like, yes, I know exactly what happened in book two. I read it yesterday. I'm on book five now. Leave me alone. But I think because the way books are written with like years between them, it made sense at the time because you read that book, you loved that book, and then you had to wait a year and a half for the next book to come out. And some kids are fast readers and will reread the first book right before the second one comes out. But some kids aren't that fast a reader or don't love reading that much. So a short summary probably really helped. Also, I don't think that rereading books was a really big thing back then. Because when these books came out, it was like the death of reading. No kids are reading anymore. I mean, tell that to Tolkien fans. I'm sure they've been rereading every word he's ever written since they came out of the womb. And they still reread it every day. <laughs> I don't know. The media liked to spin spin that no one was reading anymore. I mean, I was reading. I think maybe at that target age range of readers, there was kind of a, a lull. And I think also a part of it, maybe at least from my perspective, was before Harry Potter came out, most of the books for that age group were incredibly gendered. So they were incredibly targeted towards a stereotypical gender norm of child. So like... I mean, dinosaurs are cool and stuff. And like, I wasn't even really into sports that much then. So I didn't really want to read a short book about boys forming a baseball team or whatever and the power of friendship. Because I was like, I'm not forming a baseball team. I'm not interested. And all the characters are boys, except for the annoying little sister character. But also, most of the girl books for like the preteen young kid age range are kind of like, am I the most popular girl in school? Or like... Like, there were a couple books about unicorns that I was really into, I will say, but they had a bit of adventure in them. But still, because that's considered, unicorns are considered a rather gendered, fantastical creature, it was still pretty gendered. But I I think the thing that this book did was sort of break down those barriers. So it let boys read books in an acceptable manner to the terrible way society was at the time that also had like the importance of friendship and like a little bit of romance and like a little bit of like dealing with like hierarchy and school struggles but then also it let girls read about dragons and sword fights and big scary villains like it other books I'm sure did it but at least for me for books targeted at that age range it was one of the earlier series that just blended what was expected for girls to read and what boys were expected to read into one thing that was acceptable and it made it it gave it something that a lot of the series targeted towards me at the time yeah I think also the way that they taught reading in school was very, like, bad. Yeah, I remember, like, I had reading issues when I was really young and, like, went to the hallway and was learning to read way later than I should have been and stuff. I don't know if it was a learning disability or just what it was, really. Nothing was diagnosed. But it took me a long time to learn to read. And being told to read in the classroom and the teacher telling you what books to read didn't help really early on. Because A, I'm like, what if you're like watching the other kids, like you're writing a test and you're like, oh, they're this many pages in. I'm not that many pages in. What's wrong with me? Are they looking at me, seeing how many pages in I am and judging me? I definitely think that that played a part in a lot of why kids didn't like reading was the way of reading time was formatted in schools. Being forced to read at school probably made kids not want to read. Yeah, and I remember the library teacher was just like, if you don't know like five words in a book, you, it's too hard for you, so don't read it. And I'm like, how are you going to learn more things? Yeah, because when I read Harry Potter, like there's a lot of words I didn't know. First of all, because some of them were made up Latin-based spells, <laughs> but also because some of them were Britishisms. Yeah. Most of the, like, all the character names I did not pronounce correctly until I saw the movies. <laughs> but there's a lot of words that I didn't really know, but I inferred, like, what they were getting at. So, like, that's how I learned a lot more bigger vocabulary. It's kind of like how in the States they changed it from Philosopher's Stone to Sorcerer's Stone because they didn't think kids would learn or know what a philosopher was. I'm sure at the time I didn't really know a lot about philosophers, but I would have asked I think, like, I don't remember specifically, but I can't imagine not going up to my mom and being like, Mom, what's a philosopher? And hoping, like, old bearded dudes who think thoughts. (laughs) And me being like, oh, cool, that was a job. And then being kind of interested in the idea of philosophers. Like, I think reading slightly above your reading level is totally fine and shouldn't be discouraged. Just like I think reading a children's book that makes you happy is appropriate at any age, you know? All right, we're supposed to be talking about Harry being locked in his room where he can't practice any magic or use his broom. Uh, Yeah, it does seem weird that he needs to be kept away from all of his magical items because he can't use them per the law. The Dursleys don't know the underage restriction on magic, so that would make sense. 
I feel like at some point he maybe could have just been like, hey, I'm not allowed to use my broom outside of Hogwarts, so it's probably fine if I clean it, you know, or... Uh, I just feel like even if he they knew he wasn't allowed to use it, I just feel like they would lock his stuff away anyway, because they just don't want any, like, trace of that in, like, their house, so they, like, put it under the stairs, locked away to, like, banish it and to forget about it. The other thing that really makes me angry is the fact that he has summer homework. Like, he's really concerned he's not getting his summer homework done. Yeah, that's so strange. And, like, growing up, my mom would give me summer homework, not my teachers. Like, she'd have me spend 20 minutes every once in a while over the summer doing my multiplication tables or something when I was younger. I think just because I struggled at math and she didn't want me to forget what I had learned over the summer. But I think it's unfair of the school to assign homework to kids because if he doesn't understand something he has no one he can ask like Hermione doesn't either that's kind of the thing right if it's not in your textbook you can't ask anyone for help if you live in a muggle household yeah I wonder what homework they're like asking like assigning because like obviously it's fine for the mother like for uh, wizard families who like have brother and sisters and people that like can kind of like like you said like ask for help or talk to about it but Hermione and Harry are like with muggle families and depending on the homework like I guess it's just written homework so they can't use magic but like like how are they supposed to like learn properly if they they don't have anyone to talk to or anyone guiding them yeah I feel like it sounds it feels unfair to me to assign homework in that way it's one thing for them to like give the kids their reading lists ahead of time or something or say here's a list of some of the important dates we'll be learning about next year in history of magic if you want to start memorizing them now go ahead like that's sort of one thing that i think is fine but assigning homework that's for grades and that you get in trouble for not doing over the summer when you're not you have no access to anyone who can help you is awful. And that's not even taking into consideration Harry's circumstance, where even if it was like, hey, read this textbook and take notes on it, he still can't do that either. And it's not his fault. Yeah, he's like, sorry, my, pa- my, like, my guardians locked it away. And I'm not allowed. Sorry, I am abused at home, as you all know. So I was unable to do my homework. My bad. Really, though? You're bad. Like... Yeah, I was wondering, like, I know in some movies they talk about like, summer reading lists, like, in the U.S., but I always thought that was a movie thing. But I was wondering, is the summer homework, like, a British thing? Do, like, boarding schools assign summer homework? Or is this just, like, a Hogwarts? Well, I know that certain IP, IP, AP programs, so, like, advanced classes and stuff, will give you, like, assign you a project or something over the summer. I knew a few people who were in, like, IB, which is, like, International Bachelorette, which is, like, a another advanced thing in high school and sometimes they would have a reading list but it wouldn't be like read this textbook and do a bunch of science experiments at least from what I heard it was more like these are like books like novels you need to read so that you have the foundational knowledge to participate in our English lectures next semester kind of so sort of like instead of a teacher saying welcome to class it's November we're reading Romeo and Juliet they just have you read Romeo and Juliet over the summer which, like, I mean, reading is kind of fine in most circumstances, is, you know what I mean? Like, like, I get stuff to refresh your memory. Like, maybe there's just, like, things. Like, I remember I used to do some, like, like, like you said, like, times table stuff or just, like, books and stuff just so you're, like, you're not forgetting what you learned the previous year. So I get, like, maybe some transfiguration and charms and, like, potions and stuff to, just to refresh their memory. It's stuff they've already done. But so like going into the next year, they it's still kind of in their head. But I think actual home, like that to me, like is just revision. Like that makes sense. But assigning anything for marks or where they'll get in trouble for not doing it over the summer is unfair. Yeah, I wonder how closely they are like monitoring it. Like, is it for marks or like are they checking that it's done? Because I just feel like that's just a lot of like unnecessary paperwork. I mean, they can probably mark things magically. That's true. But I just think it's unfair. It's unfair to the kids who have no access to anyone who can help them with it. And it's unfair to the kids whose circumstances don't allow them to do homework during their home time. Yeah, what if, like, they're just busy during the summer holidays? Like, I know, like, Hermione's, like, on a vacation. And, like, what if their parents, especially if they're from a muggle family, like, I'm sure your parents want to spend time with you now that you're home for, like, a few months. And not, like, you being, like, holed away trying to finish all your summer homework. Yeah, it doesn't seem fair. I say no to summer homework. So we have, going forward in the book, we have the Dursleys are having some important Bill Dern his wife over because Uncle Vernon sells drills and he needs to sell these drills. Rather than send Harry away, Harry's going to be in his room and pretending he's not there, which 
Recipe for disaster. Yeah, 100% bad idea. And it's like, they always assume the worst of Harry. So they should expect something terrible to happen. Like, Harry does nothing on purpose. He's trying his best to behave. But because they assume the worst of him, they should be like, oh, he's going to ruin it no matter what. We should send him to Mrs. Fig's house. You know? I was just wondering, like, Harry's 12 now. And when I was 12, I used to be allowed to, like, go outside or somewhere. And like, since I don't care about Harry, I was wondering, if Mrs. Fig wasn't available, why couldn't they just tell Harry to just to leave the house for a few hours? Like, it's the summer. Go to the park for five hours. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's lighter outside. And, like, in the later books, Harry's just, like, wandering, like, the streets for how many hours? I think those are more when he's, like, a teenager. Yeah. But, like, they don't care about Harry's well-being at this point. So I was like... And, like, most 12-year-olds, so, like, my brother when he was 12 was always going out to, like, the park or out with his friends for hours. Yeah, it definitely seems like it needed to happen. He needed to be there for the plot, but not a decent amount of work was putting into justifying why it had to happen. Yeah. Like, I get the point. Maybe they didn't want him out around because they don't want to draw attention to the fact that he's, like, there. Or just like, the fact that, like, people, like, so they wouldn't want people talking about, like, him out and about and, like, what he's getting up to. Because they don't trust him. But I guess it's more like if they're, he's there, they know he's there and they can kind of keep an eye on it. But if he's out doing whatever, then like if something happens and it gets back to them, they, they look bad. Because they're all about like, especially Petunia is all about like how they appear. Yeah. It kind of feels like there's places they could have left him like that are semi-supervised. Like they could have taken him to the local library, you know, been like, you have to read this book. When we come pick you up in two and a half hours, we're going to ask you questions about the book. And if you don't answer them, we'll know you weren't reading the whole time and you're in trouble, you know? Like, there's still ways to be unpleasant and awful people while getting Harry out of the house. Make him read a terrible book. Yeah, it's definitely a plot thing. Harry had to be in the house for all of the plot things to happen. But, like, it does seem weird that Mrs. Fake's not, like... Because she was referenced in the last book as someone that would watch him when they didn't want him around. Maybe she was going to her knitting group. Or maybe she tripped over a cat again and broke her leg. Classic. <laughs> yeah, they lied about Harry's existence, which is a weird thing to do about it. I should just, maybe they should have just said that, oh, their nephew's upstairs and he's not feeling well. Yeah, literally. Or they could say, we have an owl upstairs. <laughs> they do. I mean, that might, that might be a bit weird, but... Uh... <laughs> Oh, they could totally spin that into one of those we're great people things. Like, Petunia could be like, oh, yes, he was injured. We'd reach out to the local vet. He said he shouldn't be let back out until his wing is fully healed or else he'd be at risk of being prey. So we're taking care of him. Look how humanitarian we are or animal we are. I wonder if they could spin it like they're more like rich because I know like they're probably the nurses are probably like upper middle class or middle class and wanting to appear that they're more rich than they are so they could be like oh it's this exotic pet we got for our lovely son Dudley he's such a sweet boy he asked for one and we just couldn't say no <laughs> he wanted to have a falcon for falconing because I feel like that's what the upper birds do they falcon they have like a falcon that you know but but we thought that was a bit too dangerous a bird so we've got him an owl for now and if he can take care of it as he's doing so well then he can have a falcon one day or some <laughs> such tomfoolery. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just saying they don't lie well. The Dursleys really need to be better liars if they're going to continue to neglect this child. They don't really think ahead, especially with Harry. They're just kind of like, nothing better go wrong, but we're not going to do anything else to prevent it. Yeah. They never, they never stray past their A plan. They have one plan, and if it fails, they have to go to a weird island in the middle of nowhere with a shotgun and hope for the best. Classic Dursleys. But uh, Harry has basically saying, so he's going to be stuck in his room all by himself on his birthday that no one really is, is remembering. And he's just kind of sad because he hasn't heard anything from Ron and Hermione, which I was wondering, is this just because Harry is just like not used to people caring about him? That he like, it's like, oh, they must have forgotten about me and he believes it. But I'm like, shouldn't he have known something? It's like, oh, Ron said he was going to ask him to stay at his place this summer. Like, why hasn't Ron said anything? Like, it's been like four or six weeks. Yeah. Also, he's not the most... Like, I feel like when you're a young kid, you sort of have such a shorter memory span than other than when you're older. That it's kind of like you meet a kid at camp for the week and you love them and you're best friend in the world. And then you're like, we're going to be best friends and we're going to get together on the weekends. And then you leave summer camp and like completely forget they exist and never send them a letter. Like, I feel like that's a very kids in that age group thing. And because Harry hasn't really had friends before, maybe he doesn't know like if it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. They, they like hanging out with me, but... 
because I'm around and I'm fun. But when I'm not around, they have fun lives of their own. Why would they care about me? I mean, I can easily see how a kid could easily justify why their friends don't. They forgot about me because they have loving families and they're busy. They like having me around, but what will I contribute to them when I'm not there in person? I think also Harry probably has lower self-esteem going from Hogwarts where he's like has friends and like everything's really great generally and people really like him going back to the Dursleys probably set him into a bit of a really low place especially not hearing from his friends he even questions if it like even really happened he's just kind of like going to back from like a really great place to back to like a really terrible place he's like oh well maybe this is just like the way it is but especially when he doesn't have access to any of his like magical items that he brought back from Hogwarts there's nothing tangible there for him to be like that is my life. This is a short part of my life. The summer is where I'm home. But the majority of my life is that. And it's good. Like he has nothing to hold tangibly and remember what his life is going to be like in a couple of months. So he's kind of just. Now he's getting pretty desperate. He's like counting down the days till he goes back to Hogwarts. And even in the next chapter, he's going to tell Dobby that like he doesn't belong here. And it's just very true. He just feels so out of place here. Poor Harry. He deserves. Harry is, you know, not really doing great because it's his birthday. His friends aren't aren't like around and he's stuck at the Dursleys and Dudley is teasing him. And Sassy Harry is back in full force. And he tells, Dudley tells him he knows what day it is. And Harry's like, well done. So you finally learned the days of the week. Classic Harry. And he also pretends to light a hedge on fire. And speaking of this hedge, this is the hedge where Harry's staring at it. And he's thinking about Hogwarts and his friends and just wanting to go back. And he sees a pair of eyes in the hedge. Ooh, and then he's like questioning eyes. it. But it's a little hint about what's to come in the next chapter. And of course, that's when Dudley kind of harasses him and he's like, I'm going to set the hedge on fire. And Dudley freaks out. (laughs) I love that. I love that Harry plays with them when he can because they're awful and they treat him like dirt. And it's good that he takes his moments to sort of come out on top, you know? They deserve it. (laughs) Yeah, he pays for it, though, because this is when Petunia makes, basically, it makes Harry her slave and he just cleans the entire house. But I was wondering, like, the Dursleys are... I've always assumed them to be like, like middle class and like wanting to appear more upper class as like they are always in portrayed in Britain. But I was wondering, do they can they not afford a housekeeper? Because I feel like middle class people would have like a house cleaner coming like once or twice a week. I think they would never have a house cleaner in because the house cleaner would see Harry's things and know there's another boy there. Yeah, that wasn't my, my point was the reason they don't have one is because I was thinking that Petunia is very like. She's particular and she likes tidiness and neatness. And she likes the, and it's just like the control. We know that Petunia obsessively cleans the kitchen. It's like her nightly routine. I just don't know. Like, I think it's the the idea of a housekeeper was just like the way to portray that you're like more rich is that you have like help coming in. But I also don't think that she could ever give the control up. I definitely think Petunia needs to have control over things. And I think tidiness is part of like, In Petunia's mind, the world is a really, really messy place and there's all these chaotic things like magic that she has no control over that go on around her. And I think keeping a tidy home that she takes care of and she keeps in line makes her feel like she has more of an impact on the world and her own surroundings. So like it's probably she likes to have it clean because it makes people impressed by how tidy their home is. But I think she likes to physically clean it because it is just a way for her to express power over her environment she also strives for perfection like she wanted the perfect family like based on like lily was like what made her life chaotic and she wanted perfection and even like where she lives like in this like middle upper middle class like street where all it has looked the same and like she's spying on the neighbors and stuff she wants to appear better than everyone and i just feel like yeah if there was a housekeeper it's also the con would be that like it should appear that she had staff but also like it's the harry thing like she doesn't want people to know really about harry because it's just the one thing in her house that isn't perfect yeah and then if there was a housekeeper they would overhear stuff and there's all like the housekeeper could talk and that it would just like create more gossip that she doesn't want out there and that she can't control. Yeah, I definitely think she has control issues. I can't see her passing. Even if Harry's stuff was hidden away in a secret room that the housekeeper wouldn't see ever, I don't think she would be willing to give up that much control. Because she doesn't have a lot of control. Like, she has control to abuse Harry. But she sort of, there's a huge big world out there that she's not allowed to be a part of that she resents. So I feel like the things she does have control over, she would not give up because it makes her feel powerful. Also, I predict her to be a stress cleaner. She seems like the type. 
Like Harry does something that terrifies her. He uses the word magic or something. And she's like, that's it. We're taking out the good dishes and washing them. Or like, we will dust every china set on the good dish shelf. Well, it does describe that she like cleans the kitchen to like spotlessness like every night before she goes to bed. And that just feels like stress cleaning to me. That's exhausting. Like, we're, like, we we try to maintain the tidiness of the kitchen, uh, but if we're having good company over, so people who haven't been here, like, seven times already, we're like, okay, we have to clean the kitchen. Every night, I would die. Well, moving on to neglect, as we had, talking just about Harry back at the Dursleys and this, the neglect that he suffers from every person in his life, basically. It's, it's, uh, it's awful. First of all, there's physical abuse. You have a point here about a frying pan. Yeah, uh, Aunt Petunia tries to, like, she finds out that Harry was, like, messing with Dougley, and she attempts to smack him with a soapy frying pan. And I was just like, my God, that could have given him a concussion. Like, I don't know if it's, like, a cast iron frying pan or just, like, a lighter frying pan. But I'm like, oh, my God, could have killed him. Either way, it's <laughs> assault with a weapon. Absolutely bananas. I also think, I mean, obviously, the Dursleys are neglectful as parental figures, but... Everyone knows that. So it's an incredibly neglectful and cruel of the adults in the wizarding world who are away, who are aware of Harry's situation to not be in any way reaching out to him. Like, I feel like it is the responsibility of McGonagall and Dumbledore as people who understand what the Dursleys are like to check in with Harry. Like, I feel like once a month or something, they should send him a letter. And if they receive a reply back that says something terrible has happened or they receive no reply back, they should immediately send a representative from the school to the Dursley's house in person to check on Harry's well-being at the bare minimum. Because, again, they're choosing to leave him in an abusive household. The least they could do is make sure the abuse is, I don't want to say within reason because no abuse is reasonable, but, like, make sure he's alive still. Yeah, make sure it's okay. Like, it's just, like, such a red flag, because Harry has talked about, like, how his relatives, he doesn't outright say his weapons are abusive, but he just talks about how terrible they are. And everyone knows, like, he said, Dumbledore, McGonagall, Hagrid, they all know that he lives with terrible relatives. And I'm like, shouldn't that have been a red flag for them? Like, Hagrid's been writing to Harry for most of the summer, and he hasn't heard anything back. Like, no one's heard anything from Harry. And it gets to the point where Ron and Hermione, who were children, are the ones that take like actually go forth and do something about it because they're like this is bad we haven't heard from harry we know that his aunt and uncle aren't great so we need to go check on him but no adult did yeah i think maybe it has a bit to do with like a a mind your own business attitude like i feel like some people are a lot like more snoopy in life like they want to know what's going on if there's anything wrong but there's a lot of other people who would think it's improper to invite themselves into someone else's home life because it's not I mean, it's not proper, you know, it's, it's their own personal home life and business. We should mind our own. So I feel like that's a big part of it for some people, but I do not think that should be part of it for people. I think that's how the Weasleys kind of interact with the Dursleys because they know from Harry that the Dursleys are terrible, but they're always trying to be polite to the Dursleys and they're not really trying to interfere with them, but they like, and they won't, like Harry will say something and like they'll make a face, but they won't like outwardly say anything bad about them. I think it's a little bit, people who've only heard of the Dursleys probably don't know if Harry's exaggerating or not because he's, he is an 11 year old boy and they're like, oh, he just doesn't like them. They don't let him stay up as late as he wants and eat ice cream in bed. So he's mad about it. You know, like they don't know. Yeah. Um, but also it's a little bit mind your business. They have their right to raise their ward or child, however they see fit. Uh, but it is the people who actually are in positions where they are at times responsible for Harry's well-being, which is his professors, which is Dumbledore, which is they should have a moral responsibility to keep an eye on him and make sure he's doing okay. And it's incredibly negligent that they don't. I find it hard to believe that Minerva McGonagall doesn't because I feel like in her character, she would want to know. I think... Yeah, I'm just wondering if she's asking Dumbledore because I just feel like Hagrid's there at Hogwarts. Dumbledore's probably there. And he's been like, oh, I haven't heard from Harry all summer. It's been like six weeks. I've sent him like a million letters. Like, do you, have you heard from him? Is he okay? And I'm just like, oh, yeah. Fine. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be. To me, there's no way that... I mean, I can't imagine Hagrid asking anything of Dumbledore, sort of. Like, I could see him being like, haven't heard from Harry, but not really asking him, sort of indirectly, what was me about it. I could see Minerva being like, Dumbledore, I've written Harry three letters just to remind him about the broomstick 
care or whatever, something ridiculous and unnecessary, which I think is what she would do, not like a direct checking in, are you alive? She would do like a, as the head of your house, I'm reaching in on your first summer to remind you of the rules or something. And I can't imagine she wouldn't. I can't imagine she wouldn't then go to Dumbledore and say, Harry has not replied. I'm a little bit concerned for his well-being. So, like, it's probably a headcanon, but in my mind, Dumbledore had to have just blatantly lied to them and been like, yes, Harry's fine. We're keeping a close eye on things. Don't worry. He'll be ready for the school year. Type answer. That seems like a very Dumbledore thing, because... Yeah, because Dumbledore's idea of fine is he's alive enough to deal with Voldemort when I need him to, so everything is good. So in his mind, he's not even lying, but he's totally lying. <laughs> That's what I imagine in my own mind, because I'm like, Hagrid would woes me a bit, like, why isn't Harry talking to me? And Minerva would be like, what the hell is going on? As usual, Harry gets the short end of the stick. Yeah, pretty much. And that's it for us today. If you like this episode, please consider subscribing on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you stream your podcasts. You can follow us across social media at Potter Revisited, and you can always email us anything you want at Potter Revisited Podcast at gmail.com. We will be back next time to discuss Chapter 2 of Chamber of Secrets, Dobby's Warning. See you then. Bye! Thank you.